In Jesus' name, we welcome you to our online service of worship from Kilmore Presbyterian. It's hard to believe it's six months now since we started to share our times of worship with you in this way. We trust that you'll be blessed as we join in praise, prayer, and gather around the Word of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we join as the family of God to express our love and devotion to God our Father, to rejoice in Christ our Saviour, and ask the Holy Spirit, the gracious Counselor, to guide our lives in the paths of righteousness. The scriptures say, I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. And elsewhere the psalmist writes, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the saints. We join with the praise band as we sing 10,000 Reasons. We join together in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, it would be wrong and mean of us to withhold the praise due to your name, for you alone are God. When we contemplate the beauty around us, the power of nature, the coming and going of the seasons, the ripening harvest fields and the golden shades of autumn, all of this says, our God reigns. 
The experience of human love and affection are all part of our created nature, and for that we return you thanks. Your protective power we see in the course of your plan for us, the paths down which you have not only shown us, but also accompanied us, where you have watched over us, our going out and coming in. Like lost sheep, you have come looking for us, and you have rescued us from the fowler's snare. Lord, you have redeemed our lives from the pit. You are most gracious towards us. You brought us from the deepest darkness into the most glorious day. You've turned our sorrow into overflowing joy. Lord, we are amazed that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And so we declare glory to your name. Jesus Christ, eternal Son of the Father, the lover of our souls. Thankfulness wells up from deep within us. Your love for us must surely draw nothing but praise and adoration for all you've done for us. Your cross and emblem of love and grace. Your empty tomb declares a sure and certain hope, an anchor for our souls. Holy Spirit, a a sign and seal of the promises of God, those promises of acceptance, forgiveness, and eternal life. We thank you. And therefore we bring our worship, coming from lives that readily admit our sin and craving for the cleansing that you alone can give. Lord, in your mercy, hear us. By your grace, forgive us. And by your power, renew us. For the sake of Christ our Lord, through whom we pray. And as we now join in the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Boys and girls, I wonder what makes you cry? You may think that's a funny question, but there are lots of things I think make us cry. <clears throat> Maybe you fall and hurt yourself. Maybe hurt your knee and it's really, really sore and so you, you'll cry. Or maybe you're watching a program and there's something very sad on it and so you'll cry a little bit as well. Maybe you don't want to let anybody else know that you're crying. Or, you know another thing that makes people cry? When they get really annoyed about something, get so annoyed, they just break down and cry. But there's another type of crying which I sometimes don't like, and that's whenever somebody cries just to get their own way. That's not a very good one. I would have sometimes said to to, to boys and girls in school, I don't see any tears. Why are you crying? I don't think there are real tears there at all. But I wonder, have you ever made someone cry? Have you made them cry because you've been really nasty to them? Or or maybe you've hit them and hurt them badly? Or maybe you've told lies about them? Do you ever think that Jesus cried? Well, the Bible tells us that he did. Yes, he cried whenever he was very sad because someone very close to him had died. But there was another time he cried, and that's whenever he was looking across the city of Jerusalem. And it says this in the book of of Luke. He approached Jerusalem, and he saw the city, and he wept over it. 
And you know what made him really sad about the city? Because he had come to tell them good news. He had come to tell them about God and how God loved them and how God cared for them and how God wanted to bring them peace. And they just ignored him. And he knew if they kept on ignoring him that they would be punished. And that made him really, really sad because God loved them so much. I wonder... Are we making God cry because we're ignoring him? It makes him really sad whenever we don't listen to what he tells us. Whenever he tells us that he loves us so much and, and he wants us to be his followers, his children. And yet we just ignore him. Wouldn't it be wonderful if each day we made God happy by listening to him? And by obeying him. Because we can count on God. To be there for us. Even at times when we ignore him. He is still there for us. We can count on him. To be there. Whenever we come. Crying to him. Asking for his help. And he will do that. We're going to sing. Our song that we've been learning. Counting on God. We'll sing the first bit of it. And then we listen to the praise band who will then teach us the new bit. years ago there was a programme originally hosted by Sir David Frost and Lloyd Grossman. It was called Through the Keyhole. It was aired first in April 1987. It was a show where panellists tried to work out which celebrity lived in a particular house from the visual clues found on a tour around the home. It probably was a programme best suited for the naturally nosy type of person. If there ever was an open house or garden day they would be first in the queue. Today, as we continue our series on siblings, I want to take you not so much through the keyhole into a house, but a household. In this household, there were three siblings mentioned in the Bible, two female and one male, 
two sisters and a brother. The Lord Jesus frequented their home. There he found not only a resting place, but indeed love and true friendship. For our reading, we turn to John chapter 12, verses 1 to 11, and William will read it for us. Six days before the Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, the house of Lazarus, whom uh, he really, he had, Jesus had raised from the dead. They prepared a dinner for him there, which Martha helped to serve. Lazarus was one of those who was sitting at the table with Jesus. <clears throat> then Mary took half a litre of very expensive perfume and poured it on Jesus' feet and uh, wiped them with her hair. The sweet smell of the perfume filled the whole house. Uh, one of the disciples sitting at the table was Judas Iscariot. We learn how he was going to betray Jesus. And they said, why wasn't the perfume sold for 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag and helped himself from it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Let her keep what she has for the day of my burial. You will always have poor people with you, but you will not always have me. <clears throat> a large number of people heard that Jesus was in Bethany, so they went there not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus too. Because of his account, many Jews were rejecting them and turning to Jesus. We are introduced to the three siblings in the first three verses. They are Martha, Mary and Lazarus. We will be cross-referencing to discover a little bit more about the three of them. Jesus was making his way to Jerusalem where he would be arrested, tried and condemned to death. In John's Gospel there is a phrase he loved to use. The R or in the NIV, my time. You may recall in the second chapter of John, where we find the very first miracle of turning water into wine, when Jesus' mother Mary speaks to Jesus about the wine running out. He replies, my hour has not yet come. Jesus was very much aware that there was a timetable God the Father had determined, and he was there to fulfil that plan. So here we have Jesus heading to Jerusalem. He stops off in Bethany, a place where he had stayed many times. It was about two miles east of Jerusalem and close to the Mount of Olives. Significantly, from here, Jesus ascended into heaven. This is where the three siblings lived. And then, incidentally, Simon the leper also lived here. So let's look at this household. In the first place, it was one of generous hospitality. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, just after the telling of the parable of the Good Samaritan, we read in verse 38 about Jesus coming to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. The impression here is that Martha is the elder of the two sisters. She is the generous hostess. She opened up her home to the Lord. In our passage today, John tells us that a dinner was given in Jesus' honour. It has been cited in Matthew and Mark that it was in Simon the leper's house. Anyway, again note it is Martha who is acting hostess. In two words, in verse 2, and Martha served. One writer suggests that Martha had possibly learned her lesson. There's no complaint about her sister. There had been in Luke 10, turn back with me to verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him, that's Jesus, and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. There's something here maybe you missed, and I had until it was pointed out to me. 
My sister has left me to do the work myself. It might indicate that Mary had been helping in preparations before Jesus arrived. Back in John's Gospel, Martha gets on with the work and no mention of needing help. What had Jesus said to her? Well, back in Luke's Gospel, we read, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Some see this as Jesus saying, we don't need a whole fuss. A one-course meal will do. But if we take what Jesus says next, I think we can safely say that the course of action Mary took was better. Listen to Jesus. She was doing that. Jesus said, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. From this, what can we say about Martha? First of all, her generous hospitality is unquestionable. At the same time, we see someone whose desire to be her best and to please distracted her from being attentive to Jesus' teaching. There are two things here that speak out to me very clearly. Martha opened her home to the Lord and was generous to her guests. As households, Have we opened up our home to the Lord? What do I mean? Is your home at the Lord's disposal? Is your home available for the Lord's work? I wonder, if we were to form home groups, for example, would we be willing to host? When we got married and I was in training for the ministry, we made a conscious decision that our home, manse, or wherever we were living, would always be an open house. I wonder, are we generous in our hospitality? And then the other thing which is equally important about which we need to be careful is that we don't become so busy that our time with the Lord is squeezed out. It can happen so easily. In fact, what we deem to be important work for the Lord actually may hinder our taking the time to commune with him. The second thing about this household was great adversity. In the previous chapter, chapter 11, we we hear of Lazarus. In verse 2, we read that he lay sick. We're not told the nature of the illness, but we soon become aware that it is terminal. The gravity of the situation is such that the sisters sent word to Jesus. The message to me is very touching. Lord, the one you love is sick. Here we see an example of a filial affection. This whole household knew the place they had in the Lord's heart. But despite this, the Lord tarries and Lazarus dies and is buried. The sisters are distraught at the loss of their brother. The Lord does eventually arrive four days after Lazarus has been buried. When Jesus arrives, there are the signs of disappointment. Martha says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Yet even in the adversity, we have faith and hope. She says, but I know that even now God will give you what you ask. Jesus' assurance that Lazarus would rise again is misunderstood. But the gospel message from his lips are often quoted at funerals. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. What a wonderful statement of truth and promise. And yet it's one of challenge because Jesus asks, Do you believe this? Well, do you? The tomb side scene is poignant. The grief of Mary and the other mourners caused Jesus to be deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And here we have the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Yet how deep the meaning. Jesus wept. In one sense, we have what Cecil Francis Alexander put so beautifully in the carol Once in Royal David City. The lines, 
tears and smiles like us he knew. And he feeleth for our sadness. He was sharing their sorrow. But also sorrow in that sin had brought death into the world in the first place. The miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead had two reactions. One, many who saw what Jesus did put their faith in him. Verse 45 of chapter 11. As we see reiterated in chapter 12 verses 9 and 11 where we read, Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came. Not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. On account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The other reaction was one of anger and murderous intent. In verse 10, So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. In this I see three things. Hope and adversity displayed by Martha. We see the empathy and sympathy of the Lord. And the response to the Lord, faith or rejection. It is still very much applicable today. You see, it is often in our adversity that genuine faith is revealed. Can we trust the Lord even when the situation seems hopeless? When our world is following in around us, can you say, to use the words of a song of my youth sung by the, the bachelors, I believe? Unfortunately, I've witnessed the same reaction of the chief priests and the religious leaders, that of anger and dismissal. As we delve into their psyche, we see their growing animosity towards Jesus. You see, their power base was being undermined. Their control over the people was diminishing by the hour. And to crown it all, the raising of Lazarus was giving credence to this imposter who was claiming to be the Messiah. In his actions, he was claiming to fulfill their precious scriptures. And like modern day regimes, their answer is to get rid of the opposition for good. Adversity in our lives can, as did in Lazarus' life and death, bring challenge and faith. Let me reiterate the words in verse 11. On account of him, that is Lazarus, many were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The last thing I want to highlight about this household is costly sincerity. While present in the whole family, it is in the actions of Mary that they are clearly defined. In the first instance, in Luke's account, we have Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, drinking in every word. You see, what Jesus had to say was of the greatest importance for her. And she is commended by the Master. Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Not that I would ever put myself in the same bracket as the Mary in our story. But I can remember having a conversation with a lecturer in Stramulus College. The lecturer was lamenting the fact that some music students, I being one of them, were not enthusiastic about going to concerts. Her complaint was that they could find time to go to their Bible studies and prayer meetings, but could not go to a concert. This was a sideswipe at those of us who were Christians. I wonder, how important is reading and studying God's word for you? Getting to grips with what it is saying. Going to places where we will be taught God's word. You may say, it's okay for you, you're paid to do it. That's true. But my calling is to be a teacher of God's word. Yes, I have the privilege of being released from the pressure of trying to make a living so that I can spend time to bring you God's word. But I hope you feel it is worthwhile to gather with me around the scriptures. Here in this chapter of John, we, we find an act of sincere worship. It is a costly devotion. The ointment or perfume, we are told, was derived from nard. This is an aromatic herb grown in the high pasture land of the Himalayas 
in a remote region. It would have been carried on camelback through miles and miles of mountain passes. Therefore, it was highly priced. John is at pains to point out that it was the genuine article, for he says it was pure nard. Her action of breaking open the vial and pouring it over the feet of Jesus to the surrounding audience is seen by Judas Iscariot, the thieving treasurer of the group, as being a waste. He's already done a mental calculation and estimates that it would have cost 300 days of an ordinary labourer's wage. He covers over his greedy mindset by making himself out to be a grand humanitarian aid advocate. As in many situations, others chip in and agree. The Lord's response is not a rebuttal of the need to help the poor. As he indicates, there will always be those who need our help and there will be ample opportunities for you to show that duty of care. But in this scenario, do not criticise and condemn this woman. What she has done is most touching and appropriate in this hour. Was Mary aware that Jesus' hour was near? For what she does is prophetic. As if to say, I may not have the opportunity to anoint the body of my Lord, so I will do it now. She was displaying her love and devotion to her Lord and Master. She goes even farther. She wipes his feet with her hair. What a disgrace for a woman to let her hair loose in the presence of all these people. Only loose women went about with their hair flowing. She didn't care what others thought of her. This was her act of worship. It didn't matter what it had cost her. It didn't matter that people were offended by her action. She had embraced the opportunity. In Matthew and Mark's account, in the words of one commentator, as a reward for Mary's golden deed, Jesus adds a beautiful promise. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Worship is not just what we do on Sundays when we gather. For the believer, as Paul would write to the church in Rome, it is a daily matter. He writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And listen to this which is your spiritual service of worship. We need to ask ourselves some questions. Does our worship cost us anything? Do we take our worship seriously? Is it genuine? Is it showing our love and devotion to our Saviour Jesus Christ? To draw our meditation to a close, let me recap. The household in our thoughts today was one of generous hospitality. The dinner held in Jesus' honour may have been, as some have suggested, to show their appreciation of the amazing miracle performed in the previous chapter. But as we have seen, it was not a one-off show of hospitality in that household. Martha is depicted as the perfect hostess who puts her home at the Lord's disposal, yet things get a wee bit out of perspective. And then we have seen great adversity. The death of Lazarus brought immense grief and loss. Yet we have heard of astounding faith. Out of this situation there is a furtherance of the gospel and the kingdom of God. And then in the very moving and tender scene we have costly sincerity. Nothing was too much for the Lord. And a willingness to be maligned for such a display of commitment and devotion, though probably considered, did not affect her actions. I'll detain you no longer. Save to say, what is the Lord saying to you today from this passage of scripture? Talk to him about it. Amen. Our prayers for others will be led by Carol, after which we will sing, Not I, but Christ in me.
Let us pray. Loving God and Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, knowing that as we pray, you are listening to us. We come needy as ever. We acknowledge that we are dependent on your love and mercy day by day. The world in which we live is constantly changing. The current crisis means each day brings new challenges and often many difficulties. We praise you that you know and understand what is going on. We are thankful that you are in control of all things. When we are born and when we die is in your hands and according to your perfect will. Nothing in this world happens without your knowledge of it and by your permission. We therefore submit to your sovereignty. In the light of this Lord God, we bring our thanks and praise along with our requests. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of being back together for worship. We pray that you will continue to guide the leaders in the decisions they make with regard to our meeting in comfort and safety. We praise you for the opportunities that you have to be able to have our online services of worship. We pray that as the service go out each week, people will be challenged and blessed by the messages in word and song. We ask that you bless all those who give of their time and talent to lead us in worship. Guide those who preach your word that it will be made relevant to our lives today. We think of those in positions of authority over us, especially our politicians. Lord, they need your direction as they seek to lead us through this pandemic. We pray that all of us will take responsibility for our actions, to care for one another, and in particular look out for the elderly and vulnerable in our society. We continue to remember those in frontline services, especially those who work in the medical sector. We realise how vigilant they must be and how they are risking their lives for the good of others. Bless them, we pray. Lord, we recognise the importance of the education of our young folk. We pray for the principals and governors of schools and colleges. Help them to make the right call when they are when they are faced with difficult situations. We pray for the teachers, parents and pupils alike. We ask the young folk will appreciate the privilege it is to be able to go to school. We think of other countries where the young folk do not have the same opportunities. We pray for the places where there is much sickness, suffering and death. We pray for the mothers who watch their babies starve, for those left as orphans because of famine, flood or war. We pray for those bringing them aid, clean water, food and life-saving essentials. Give us the compassion of Christ as we look out upon a needy world. As we have been richly blessed, may we in return be generous towards those who need our help. Hear us, Lord, and answer us, for we come in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
As we enter into a new week, let us be constantly aware of the debt we owe our Lord. With renewed resolve, let us go in his name and for his sake, by lip and life, spread abroad the honours of his name. To strengthen us, we bless one another with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>